Welcome back to the Bible and its cultural influence. I'm Seth Pace, and today we're going to be talking about the teachings of Jesus, part three. And we're going to be focusing specifically on an encounter Jesus has with the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the Herodians, and most likely the temple area. So this story is found in Matthew 22, Mark 12, and Luke 20. And it's going to focus on three specific stories that are all linked together as part of a greater conversation. You have paying taxes to Caesar, the story of the widow and her husbands, and then the greatest commandment. Now, the greatest commandment is not found in the Luke chapter 20 passage, but the conclusion of Matthew and Mark is also found in Luke, which is interesting. But one of the things we need to do first is we need to talk a little bit about who the different groups of Jews were. Because if you understand that, then you gain a deeper understanding of what Jesus is actually doing when he responds and how he responds to each group. So, first thing we need to do is look at the different groups. As you see here, we have the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the Essenes, and the Zealots. So, let's go through a little bit and see if we can gain a little deeper understanding of them. So Pharisee means to set apart, and they were a separatist movement. They wanted to reestablish the Davidic kingdom, uh, the kingdom of David, and get rid of Rome. Now, they were experts in the law. We know quite a few Pharisees from Scripture and from other writings. Uh, we know that Paul, of course, was a Pharisee, originally known as Saul. And we'll talk more about him in a couple of weeks. We know that Joseph of Arimathea was a Pharisee, uh, Josephus, the historian, uh, Nicodemus, and Gamaliel, the leader who helped teach Paul and who defended the apostles before the Sanhedrin. Now, the Pharisees tended to be a little more open in their mindset. They believed in the Torah, but they also believed in all the other writings that are in what we call the Jewish canon. They believed in the oral traditions, the resurrection of the dead, supernatural events, the afterlife, angels. All these were completely acceptable to the Pharisees. Now, as the temple was destroyed in 70 AD and the Jews were scattered, then the Pharisees started turning and they started to develop the rabbinic traditions. So they would become basically the rabbis after 70 AD. The Sadducees. The Sadducees, it's a little more questionable where their term comes from and what their name means. Um, some think it means to be just or right. Uh, the Sadducees believed that they could trace their lineage back to Zadok or the sons of Zadok. And Zadok was the first high priest of the first temple. And he was a descendant of Eleazar, who, of course, is the son of Aaron and the brother of Moses. So it goes all the way back to the first high priest of God during the Exodus. Because of this, they maintained the priestly duties. They looked after the temple and they had a belief that their status in Jewish culture was probably the highest. They rejected all but the written Torah. So they didn't believe that there was fate. They didn't believe that the soul was immortal. Um, they did not believe that there were penalties or rewards necessarily after death. Pretty much life is it. Now, there was a strange exception. A lot of Sadducees did believe in the concept of the Sheol, or the gray underworld that you would go to after you died, which it seems kind of contradictory because they didn't really believe, for the most part, in an afterlife or a reward or punishment after death. But 
humanity sometimes can be very complicated. Now, it's also necessary to remember that they only believed in the Torah because when Jesus is going to engage them in conversation in today's discussion, you'll notice that Jesus quotes from Exodus 3. So he's using the very book that they value to answer their question. The third group we have are the Herodians. Now, the Herodians supported the rule of Herod. And the Herods, there are quite a few of them, which we'll talk about when we get to the trial of Jesus. But the Herods were supported by Rome. So by supporting the Herods, the Herodians are saying that they support Rome. So you see there's an issue there, especially with, say, the Pharisees who want to be uh, reestablish the Davidic kingdom and get rid of Rome. But the Herodians are only mentioned three times in the Greek text. We have Matthew 22, Mark 3, and Mark 12, which you probably realize that two of those passages are today's conversation. They were not a religious sect or a political party. The fourth group we have are the Essenes. And the Essenes are very mysterious. We don't have a lot of information on them. We do have multiple historians who talk about them. And we think that the Greek word for the Essene means holiness or set apart. Now, like the Pharisees, the Essenes were concerned with purity, uh, strict adherence to the law. But they tended to isolate themselves in tight-knit communities. We know that there was a group of them that lived near the Dead Sea. They supposedly are the ones who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls and then stored them in the caves. They believed in ritual baptism and cleanliness. And they carried this out to the extreme. If you wanted to become an Essene, there were several historians who actually listed the requirements for becoming an Essene. One of them was you had to go through a three-year trial period before you could be accepted into the community. Uh, Pliny the Elder said that they possessed no money. They had existed for thousands of generations, and they had a priestly class that did not marry. Josephus and Philo of Alexandria also wrote about them, and that's about all we know of them. There are some other kind of legends about the Essenes. Um, some believe that John the Baptist was an Essene, which is why he valued baptism so much in his teachings. There supposedly is a collection of letters and documents of the Essenes in the Vatican hidden within their vaults. But that's about all we know of them. And then the last group we have are the Zealots. And the Zealots were radical Jews who sought to overthrow the Roman regime through violence. They would often wear daggers or swords strapped to their thigh. And then they would saunter up to a Roman soldier, draw the dagger and stab them between the ribs. And then run off. Their rally cry was no king but God. And we do know that they were around. I mean, we do have in the Apostles, we have Simon the Zealot, and some believe, was he really just zealous for God, or was he actually part of this group? Well, after the Last Supper, when Jesus said, does any of you have swords? Remember, they popped up the Apostles and said, we have two swords, which means at least one or two of the guys probably were zealots. These were the main groups that were around Jesus when he was teaching. And the first story we're starting with is the story of the coin. So, it says that in Mark 12, later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others, because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. 
Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Okay, so what is the trap that they're setting for him? Jesus is stirring up the status quo and the Jewish leaders don't like this. They work very long and hard to establish and get things set up so that they have an advantage. And now this carpenter from way out in the middle of nowhere shows up preaching with authority and healing people and stirring things up. So, the Pharisees and Herodians are so desperate to get rid of him that they're willing to work together. Remember that their political agendas are completely opposite. So they come up to him. And they ask him this question. So they're setting a trap for him. And <clears throat> the trap is this. If Jesus answers yes, that you should pay Rome the tax then the Pharisees are going to be upset with him. And they're going to go spread and tell everybody, well, Jesus says that the Roman Empire is more important than the state of Israel. If he says, no, don't pay the tax, then the Herodians can run and tell Herod and the Romans, well, he's stirring up rebellion saying that we shouldn't pay you for our tax. So most people would think there's no way out of this question one way or the other he's going to offend somebody and they're going to run off and tell the authorities but jesus has this amazing ability in a lot of his conversations to t listen to them to look at the rules and then he just completely flips it and goes a completely different route that answers the question and is something that no one's probably thought of before so you come down jesus says in verse 15 that he knew their hypocrisy yeah. in mark it says hypocrisy and matthew it says he knew their evil intent and then in luke it actually says he knew their duplicity and then he follows up with why are you trying to trap me okay so he asked him to bring a coin now this is an interesting point that most people miss the jewish people tended not to carry Roman coins with them. They considered it a form of idolatry because the Roman coins, which I'll show you, here we are, tended to be stamped with the image of Caesar on one side and his name on the back, which during the life of Jesus or this particular time in the life of Jesus, that would have been uh, Tiberius Caesar Augustus. So that would have been his image. And because a lot of the emperors of Rome believed that they basically were walking gods, the Jews considered it offensive to carry their image. So instead, they would mint their own coins. The denarius that was paid to the Romans for taxes was usually this coin, and it was usually made out of silver. The coins that most Jews carried were made out of copper and they minted them themselves with no image on it like this and so when jesus says bring me a denarius and someone pops up and goes here's one that means that someone is carrying the coin that most jews would not carry so perhaps one of the herodians had the silver denarius on him with the roman emperor it's possible but it does say that they were amazed at him and then we move to the next story which is the widow so it says then the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him with a question so the Pharisees and Herodians have failed so here come the Sadducees the priest and they're gonna set forth another interesting question for him and try to trick him now, there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died leaving no children. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Least of all, 
Last of all, the woman died too. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be, since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, Are you not in error, because you do not know the scripture or the power of God? When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. So what's going on here exactly? Well, the Sadducees, again, just like the Pharisees and Herodians in the story before, are desperate. And we know they're desperate because they don't believe in the resurrection. And they don't believe in any other religious text except for the Torah. The story they're quoting to Jesus is the story of righteous Sarah. And the story of righteous Sarah is found in the book of Tobit, which is a deuterocanonical text. So they're quoting to him something that they don't believe from a source that they definitely don't believe to see if they could catch him. Now in the story of righteous Sarah or pious Sarah, she marries and the demon Asmodeus becomes jealous of her. If you don't know this, it's okay. Uh, Asmodeus is considered by many to be the king of hell. He's one of the head demons of the nine levels of hell. And this ties into a lot of other mythology and stories. But according to the book of Tobit, um, Sarah marries Asmodeus, is jealous. Um, and so he kills her husband on the wedding night. And he does this repeatedly until the end and this of course ties into levitical law the reason that the first man his brothers have to marry sarah goes back to leviticus where if your brother dies then you are supposed to marry his wife and then the first son that is born is considered your brother's son and that is for inheritance rights and we've talked about that a little bit and back in the Hebrew text. I'll try to get back to that later. And there were rabbis that did preach that if, or there were rabbis that did teach that if a woman became a widow two or three times, then she should not marry again because something was off about her or around her. So that kind of builds on this story. But, Jesus responds brilliantly, and he does this because he actually quotes back to them a passage from the Torah, okay. and he brings up something. They don't believe in the resurrection, so he quotes down at the bottom. He says, he, first of all, he brings up the fact that you won't be married or be given in marriage, but you'll be like the angels in heaven. This particular passage, I think, has done more to confuse people. Um, this is where you will get people who say that when we die, we go to heaven, we get wings, we get a halo, we become like angels. No, you don't. Angels were created. They're their own critter, completely separate from us. When we die, we don't become angels. Jesus says we become like angels, meaning we become immortal like angels. Which again, plays on the Sanhedrin's belief that there is no such thing as angels or afterlife. And then he brings up, what is Jesus saying here when he quotes this passage from Exodus? He says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. It's a little bit misleading in English. Because you read it and we're like, why would that offend them? Well, the terms that he's using there, the tense is present. 
So he's quoting the passage from Exodus that means that all of these things are happening in the same moment. So for God, everything continues to exist, whether you are alive or not. Time continues. In other words, there is an afterlife, he's implying. So Jesus is using the very text that these guys are supposed to be expert in to prove to them a point that they're wrong about in their belief system. And then he comes down and says, you notice what I have highlighted in red. You have not read and you are badly mistaken, which Mark is the only one that puts in you are badly mistaken because it's Mark and he likes being action and controversy and things of that nature. But this ties back into a fascinating insult that you could do as a rabbi. Uh, one of the things that when rabbis were talking, if you really wanted to drive home the point that you're, the person you're debating or talking with may not know what they're doing, then you would say something like, go and read. Meaning, you need to go back and reread the scripture because you really don't know it. Or, <laughs> even harsher kind of insult would be to say, have you ever read? Which is exactly the one that Jesus uses right here. And then, by following up, you're badly mistaken. He's just driving the nail in the coffin. He's pointing out to them, you don't know what you're talking about. You're supposed to be the experts in the Torah and you don't know it all right so that leads us to the third conversation oh let me point this out to you this is a, a passage from the book of Tobit right here let me show you this is the book of Tobit and this is an artist rendition of Asmodeus, uh, the king of hell, who is also tied to usually sexuality and lust and things because a lot of demons are. Kind of a messed up looking guy, isn't he? All right, so that leads us to the last, the closing part of this conversation with all these leaders, the greatest commandment. <clears throat> So, one of the teachers of the law, which means probably a Pharisee, came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You're right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and with all your love, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifice. When Jesus saw how he had answered wisely, start over. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. This was a very common question to ask rabbis. You wanted to find out what do you really value. And it wasn't unusual for rabbis to give these two passages. And remember that we've seen this before in the story of the Good Samaritan. The first one, the love of the Lord your God, is of course the Shema from Deuteronomy 6. And the love your neighbor as yourself is the one we talked about from Leviticus 19. So, the interesting thing in this, though, is the response Jesus gives and the response the man gives before that. Pardon me. 
because the young teacher says to love him with all your heart, all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifice. Remember that the leaders are standing around. The Sadducees, who are the priestly class, and the Pharisees are listening to this. And this young Pharisee just said, that's more important than the burnt offerings and sacrifice. So he does bring up a point. This also would be a rather jarring statement for all of the Sadducees standing around listening to this. And then Jesus responds that you've answered wisely. He said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. That is an incredible compliment that he's paying this young man. He's answered the questions and gotten out of the traps that they've tried to set for him. He's shown them how in error they were. And now to wrap it all up, he's responded with the correct response to the greatest commandment. There is nothing else to ask him. So the leaders are going to have to leave now because they couldn't accomplish their goal of trapping him and getting him arrested and killed. So I find this particular engagement of Jesus and the leaders fascinating because it shows the out of the box thinking that Jesus has the brilliance that he has and the purity of heart and how he's able to point out exactly what needs to be done that you've been focusing on paying taxes that's not important you need to focus on what's God's that they focus on things like well, what's going to happen in the afterlife and he's like you need to go back and reread scripture and focus on what's important it's not coming up with hypothetical situations it's look at scripture and see what it says and then we get to the greatest commandment which is a beautiful way to wrap up any discussion but they weren't able to get him so they're going to have to try to figure out something else which we're going to talk about in the coming lectures because our next lecture will be over Palm Sunday and the Holy Week. And then the lecture after that, I will begin the trial of Jesus. This lecture will be the trial of Jesus and his crucifixion, setting up our discussion for Resurrection Sunday, or what most of our culture calls Easter Sunday. Have a great day, and Shalom.